All right. So uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to speak at the, the men's prayer breakfast, and one of the things I had mentioned was like not necessarily talking about New Year's resolutions, but how we could take advantage of a new year being a fresh start. And uh, I didn't do that for the men's prayer breakfast because I was asked to do this, and I th and just in praying through it, and I, I said, I thought, I feel that the Lord guided me that this would be a better venue to, uh, to talk about that. So tonight's title is New Year Fresh Start because everything's better fresh. Uh, actually, uh, you know, it, it's about trying to find God's mercy. And I say, you know, New Year Fresh Start because as humans, we are very conditioned at the turn of a new year to do what? To try and find a way to make ourselves better. God doesn't care what time of year it is. We're always welcome to make that fresh start. We are always welcome to turn ourselves over to him, whether that be in the need of salvation or if you're already saved, you know, uh, giving yourself to him so that you can be in his mercy all the time. And so when we talk about mercy, I think it's important. My phone locked again. I should have had this wrote down. It's tough when I try and do something old school and then actually try and take advantage of, of technology. Um, but it's important to define mercy. And so mercy is simply compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So I think, you know, when you think about mercy from any perspective, right, uh, you know, we, we can think about it from, from biblical stories. We can think about sports, right, the mercy rule. You know, you can just keep scoring runs in a, in a baseball game, but they put a mercy rule in so that you, you stop doing that. So mercy is, is simply showing uh, compassion or forgiveness to someone who you could absolutely show uh, or, or hurt, right? You can absolutely hurt, punish or harm. Um, I think when we think about it spiritually, we are all in that position where God absolutely owes us a good spanking, right? Uh, <laughs> any given time, Jerry, Snell, I mean, any given time, <laughs> um, any, at any given time, we, we all have earned a good, a good whipping from God, but he shows us mercy. And, and to think about, you know, why does he show us mercy? Well, it's because of his grace which also is important to define, uh, grace being simply goodwill, courteous goodwill, right? So, you know, God shows us a lot of grace. He shows us a lot of mercy. Uh, but we do need to do some things to, uh, I don't know if earn it is the right word, but, you know, to, to find ourselves in his mercy. So just as, as some of the background, um, you know, when I think of the struggle of struggles for us as Christians, right, Something that is just absolutely counterintuitive for us. Am I ringing, Jeff? I'm already loud, so. Um, you know, it's the thing that can make our lives messy. It can, it can cause conflict in our relationships. Uh, you know, it, things that sidetrack our thoughts. Um, you know, it's, it's the thing that points out to our, our need for grace, uh, our need for um, you know, finding a, a way out of the battle that we just can't ever escape. Um, you know, the, the one place where 10 out of 10 of us need rescue, um, you know, but we, we need to turn to God to fight it on our behalf. Um, you know, th this constant struggle that we have is simply that it's not about us. It's about God. Um, it's about God and his plan for us. It's about God and his kingdom and it's about God and his glory. And how often do we get caught up in, and look, I'm going to do the Tom Knox, right? When I'm pointing at you, I got all these fingers pointing back at me. Because how often does Mike Graver get caught up in what I've got going on? You know, in, in you know, all these big important things that I have, whether it's, it's working with the, the city of North College Hill or whether it's you know, working at Steelcraft or, you know, doing things here at the church, how often do I just look at, you know, man, what a, what a great job I'm doing. And, and it happens, you know. So I struggle with that daily, but it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It is about God. It's about 
uh, his plan uh, for us, and it's about uh, pointing everything we do towards his glory. So simply to get to, uh, to where we are, are receiving God's mercy, what are some of the real, realizations that we must all make? Okay, so I, I think the first one is exactly what I just said, right? Our Christian life is not about us. It is about him. Um, so we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight. So uh, I hope you like to, uh, to read along, but we're going to start in Psalm 115. Um, you know, again, you know, when, if, if we want to find ourselves in God's good grace in, and receive mercy from God, we need to make the realization that our Christian life is not about us, it's about him. So in verse 1, we're going to read 1 through 18 of Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the, heaven, the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. We have done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Ye are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath, hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth, and forevermore praise the Lord. So talks about all these things that, that, that we have, and, and you know, if you try and visualize, you know, right? They have mouths and they can't talk, and they have noses and they don't smell, and they have ears and they can't hear, all right? And that is when we get caught up in trying to do things of our own device, right? That, that's where we are left, you know? So I really like that first, ver first verse there, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. You know, it, it very clearly points out in the first verse where we should put our focus because it's not about us. It's about him. So that's the first realization. It's not about us. It's about him. The second realization is that rest, everybody needs rest, right? I didn't get my nap today. That's why I'm cranky. Right, Jerry? Did you get your nap, Jerry? Oh, man. Sorry, Shirley. Rest, which we all want, we all need, rest is not found in figuring your life out. If you want rest, you're not going to get it trying to figure your life out. And, you know, again, I, I look at how, how often I get caught up in trying to figure it out or we try and make our plans to, to get all the things done that we have to get done. And we don't get any rest in that. Our rest is found in trusting the one who has it all figured out. And if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all right? So think about this. Do you ever just try to figure your life out? You know, I've got this. I can handle this. You know, I got, I got 24 hours in the day to, to, to get all these things done. And where do we end up? Well, if you're spending 24 hours a day trying to figure your life out, you're not getting the rest that you need. So if you want to find that rest you got to trust in the one who's figured it all out. So in 2 Corinthians 5, we'll read verses 1 through 10. 
For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon, be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the, same, the self same thing is God, who, ha, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And I like that, right? We can be confident that while we're at home in our body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So, if we try and take it all on ourselves and figure it all out, figure it all out ourselves, we will never find that rest. All right? We can be confident that if we're doing it on our own, we're not trusting in God to help us with those things. And at the end of the day, you know, why is it so hard for us to give in to Him, to trust Him, to help us with that? Um, you know, I, I can think of examples in my own personal life when, you know, I. I really, really made that focused effort to turn, turn it over to God. And you know what? You don't always get the exact result you want, but at the end of the day, it's the result that we need. And so, you know, that, that's where we need to, to make sure we are trusting in God to, uh, to receive his mercy and his grace, because that's where we're going to find our rest. So number one, Christian life is not about us. It's about him. Number two, rest is not found in figuring your life out. It's found in trusting the one who has it all figured out. Number three, and we'll go to Luke chapter 12 for this one, and, and maybe spend a couple extra minutes on this one as, as opposed to some of the other ones. But if eternity is the plan, if eternity is the plan, then it makes no sense to shrink your living down to the needs and wants of this little moment. As a born-again believer, eternity should absolutely be the plan, right? So why do we constantly get caught up in the, the day-to-day or the minute-by-minute things that we have going on in our lives? And think about when you get all caught up in that day-to-day or that hour-by-hour or that minute-by-minute, what are some of the things that it leads to in our lives? Worry? Fear? doubt you know i i i get afraid to to say things at at work maybe that should be said right or i doubt myself in in a decision i make you know and, and i'm sure that we've all felt those same things but if the plan truly is our eternity then why do we get caught up in these these little things these needs these wants of this exact moment so in luke chapter 12 Uh, We'll start in verse 13 and read through verse 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, "Man Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room whereto bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, 
This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So how many times have we sat in a church service or a Sunday school class and that parable has come up as part of a lesson? Right? What was this master's plan when he decided he needed bigger barns for all of his stuff? Was he thinking about the long game? Was he thinking about eternity? It doesn't sound like he was. Uh, you know, and I think that it's proven in verse 20 because God said, what did God call him? Thou fool. All right? So I, I, I guess I could almost say that I get aggravated with myself when I get caught up in the, the worry, the fear, the doubt of the day-to-day -day and these decisions that we're making that seem like such big decisions. Right? It, it, the ramifications are huge. But when you compare them to God and his plan, which is eternity, yeah, they're, they're, they're nothing, right? They're not even a drop in the bucket to, uh, to what he has. So, you know, how do we get out of thinking about and focusing about the, the needs and wants that we have in these little moments and putting eternity as our plan? So... The fourth realization that we need to make is that acceptance is based on Christ's righteousness, not yours. No matter how obedient you or I are. Think about that for a minute. And when we talk about acceptance, right, it's acceptance into, into heaven. It's acceptance into that eternity. The acceptance is, not, is based on Christ's righteousness, not yours. There is no amount of works, no amount of good deeds that you can do to get God's mercy, to get God's grace, to spend that eternity in heaven. All right? You know, when we, we think about ultimately what gets us into heaven, right? It's that faith and trust in Jesus, and that's all based on the blood that he shed, right? It's not based on our works doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing things here on earth you know uh, our time at Ronald McDonald House is well spent it is a great opportunity to, to do something good you know we talk about the the college and career class doing this polar plunge it's great it, God absolutely expects us to help out our fellow man right those that are in need um, but none of that, no matter how much it falls in line with what God wants us to do, is going to get us that acceptance. It is all based on Christ's righteousness. Uh, if you want to turn to Galatians chapter 3, that will be our next reading. Um, you know, uh, again, when we, when we think that it's our righteousness that is what's getting us through, and, and we've got that, I'm going to pat myself on the back mentality and, and everything is awesome here, we're not going to find God's grace in that. We have to make sure that we are getting our acceptance based on his righteousness. So in Galatians 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 14. O foolish Galatians, who hath, be, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. 
So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for they just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but that but but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so when we when we you know look at that, you know. I like the fact that the you know some of these scriptures right it's talking about foolishness and, and fools and right the fools are those that take things upon themselves um, so we need to make sure that we have that realization that our acceptance is is based on Jesus Christ and his righteousness not our own there's nothing nothing we can do uh, to get that acceptance number five contentment celebrates grace the contented heart is satisfied with the giver and therefore freed from craving the next gift. Uh, this next reading will be in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, who here likes to give gifts? Who here likes to receive gifts? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, the, 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 old, uh, the old saying, it's better to give than receive. And I think, you know, as children, it's all about receiving gifts. As you get into adulthood, you, you begin to learn and understand the joy in giving gifts. Um, you know, the contented heart is satisfied with the giver. And I'm going to say the giver here is a capital G, right? Our contentment is in what Christ has given us, all right? And if we are, if we are satisfied with the giver, then we are now free from craving the next gift. Um, in 1 Timothy 6... Verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You can't take it with you, can you? And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So this is a, a passage here that literally says, right, uh, godliness with contentment, right, being content with what the giver has given us is great gain. And then it gets into, you know, the, the lusts and the desires of wanting that next gift whether it, it it's money or cars you know we all all think that the the best thing that can ever happen to us is a big house you know that fancy cadillac or or whatever it is right and, and what we really need to be satisfied with is what jesus christ can give us that is what puts us in a place of being in his grace and his mercy all right the sixth realization is that you need it every day and by it it is the indwelling presence of the holy spirit so if you turn to romans 8 uh, we'll start in verse 1 there but you know think about this all right you need it every day and it is the indwelling presence of the holy spirit um, you know, sometimes it, it is very difficult uh, to think about this, um, but that's the, the whole point, right? This isn't about thinking. This is about uh, putting our trust in God. This is about having that relationship, that true relationship with God, you know, that you can only have through Bible study, Christian fellowship, and, and a good prayer life, and I think we all can probably uh, say it would 
wouldn't hurt us to work on our prayer life. Uh, I'm absolutely guilty of that. It, it comes and it goes sometimes, and I and I don't. You know, it, it's hard to have that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit when you you know you're not utilizing your your prayer life as you should. So in Romans eight. Uh, starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 17. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of this. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin." but the Spirit is life because of the righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of, bond, of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know, very simply put, right? If we don't have the uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit, you know, then we are stuck in our flesh, and flesh at the end of the day dies, doesn't it? Right? It, it's that spiritual side. It's having that indwelling Spirit. You know, that that's what we're going to uh, to live um, on throughout eternity. Um, you know, in verse nine it says, "Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ." It says he is none of this, of none of his. All right? If if uh, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, you are none of his. So we need it every day. We need that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the seventh thing to realize is that the DNA of joy is thankfulness. Have you ever noticed an entitled, complaining person being very joyful? The DNA of joy is thankfulness. And uh, we're going to go to Psalm 107 for the, this next reading. But, uh, you know, I, I, I find that, uh, you know, when I've turned over my thought process to one of thankfulness and, you know, by thankfulness, I mean thanking God for the blessings we have rather than dwelling on, well, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't have that big Cadillac and my house is small or, or whatever it is, right? It's very, very difficult to be joyful. You know, that, that, is, that is just so simple to think about if, you, you know, if you're content in what you have and you're thankful for it, it is a lot easier to have that joy, to have a smile on your face. So in uh, Psalm 107, and uh, this actually, uh, this passage, we're going to go from 1 to verse 43. Starts with, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. You catching a pattern here? In verse 20, he sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. Verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves therefore are, are thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. A fruitful land unto, into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease." Again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and caused them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like, the, like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. So, you see that pattern there where the, those that were focused on the things of this world and they would get down and God would give them what they need and they would bless God and, and you know, it's that the, the, the Jews in the wilderness and the, they would come to God and then they'd stray and they come to God and they stray. Um, you know, but it ends here talking about the righteous seeing it and rejoicing and uh, those that understand the loving kindness of the Lord uh, are the ones that are observing these things and they don't have the ups and downs. You ever get caught in the ups and downs of life? All right? If you have a thankful heart all the time, you're going to be a lot more level than, than having the ups and downs. And again, that thankfulness is for what God has given to us, uh, for what God um, blesses us with, you know whether it's this incredible church family that we, uh, we all get the opportunity to enjoy, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the, the families we have, obviously, for our salvation, for the salvation we see of our family members, 
you know, there, there's a lot to be thankful for. And, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, the last two years, I've had to deal a lot with the COVID-19 pandemic because I'm an environment health and safety person at work. And this kind of falls under the health part of, of that, you know. So uh, all the different things that we've had to do and the changes and, and making people stay home from work and we're wearing masks at work again and, and all these things, it can be very, very easy to get down in the dumps. You know, I think, man, this is stupid. And I'll be honest with you, I think that quite often. Um, but be thankful for what God has given me, which is a great opportunity at a great job that, you know, I can, you know, use it more to, uh, to get his agenda across and not my own. Um, so when we talk about the, the seven things there, that, that the seven realizations we need to, to make, you know, I want to say that the first step to fixing a problem is what? Admitting there's a problem, right? That's the first step. So, you know, it's taking the initiative for us all to admit that living as people, living for the glory of another is not natural for us. We want to self-promote. We want to self-gratify. We want to, you know, it's not natural for us to live for the glory of another in our uh, human skin. Um, but the first four words in the Bible are what? In the beginning, God. That's pretty important, isn't it? Creation was made by him, for him. You know, what is our purpose here each and every day? Is it for us to be caught up in our minute-by-minute -minute problems? Or is it for us to point all the things we do to his glory, all right? Everything we do uh, should point to the glory of God. And uh, I can think of no greater example of this than the Apostle Paul. And uh, I've been doing a lot of extra reading on, on Paul, uh, I guess maybe sparked by the, the chosen story and the, and the, you know, seeing some of those things. So I've really spent a lot more time reading about Paul. I know Paul's not in the chosen, but you know, he is a, he's an intriguing example of somebody who was clearly caught up in the day to day, right? Persecuting Christians and doing all of those other things. Um, but he is a great example. Uh, and it's the example that he's setting here is one single verse in first Corinthians chapter 10. If you would like to, to turn there. Um, you know, Paul absolutely believed that every single thing we do should be done to the glory of God. And in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, he says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Read that again. Whether therefore ye eat or drink. Anybody here eat or drink today? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You know, when, when Paul thinks of his call to live for the glory of God, he's not thinking about those big ticket things, right? He's not thinking of the big life-changing spiritual moments, right? He doesn't talk about when he was struck blind and, <laughs> you know... You talk about a salvation experience, right? I mean, that is, that, that, that is like one of the most awesome salvation experiences ever that Paul got to experience. That's not what he talks about here. He talks about something that is mundane, something that is repetitive. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to eat and drink, man. You know, you, you put, put a steak in front of me, I'll, I'll, sing, I'll sing praises all day. But, you know, Paul focuses on a small thing that we do each and every day. Whether you eat, whether, whether therefore you eat or drink, do that to the glory of God. Everything we do, um, we should be doing towards the glory of God. So that is where our fresh start comes in. It's that desire to give it all to him. And with that, we'll close in prayer. If everyone will bow. Lord, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity again to be here in your house, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that, uh, that this message 
uh, is something that we can all uh, think about, Lord, that we can all dwell on and that we can all apply to our lives, Lord. We're just thankful for the many examples we have in the Bible, but particularly for that example of Paul, Lord, and, and uh, how he gave us uh, a, a good guide to how to live a Christian life through tough times. Uh, he, Lord, he, he just give us so many good examples. And we do pray now, Lord, that, you know, even through something as simple as, as sitting down to, to lunch, Lord, that we'll do that and, and try and point it to your glory. And then, Lord, just take that into everything we do in our life, whether we're at work, whether we're at the grocery store, Lord, that we will use those opportunities to not rely on ourselves, to not get caught up in the fear and the doubt of trying to live in this moment, Lord, and put the eternal plan, your eternal plan, uh, first in, in those things that we're doing, Lord. And, Lord, I just pray that through that uh, we'll, we'll see some, some re, a revival, Lord, uh, you know, a, a regenerated spirit where we're out you know, looking for those opportunities, Lord, to win souls for you. We just pray now, Lord, for all those prayer requests that we, uh, we talked about earlier, Lord, uh, for, for those that are sick, for those that uh, need your healing, Lord. We just pray that you will bless them, that you will bless the doctors that are dealing with them and give them the, the wisdom to, to make the right decisions, Lord. We just pray for uh, the Kellers as they're traveling home. Just uh, grant them safety, Lord. And we now pray at this time for, for safety for everyone here as we travel home. Lord, we just pray that you will uh, grant us that safety and that, again, we'll, uh, we'll apply the things that we have heard today into our everyday lives. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen.